Hello, platform. My name is Jonathan Safran Four. I'm an author, most recently of the book We Are the Weather, Saving the Planet Begins at Breakfast. And I'm here to talk to you today about some assumptions about climate change. It is a hassle to think about climate change, but I'm not sure what it would mean for it to be too much of a hassle. God forbid you got a cancer diagnosis. It would be a strange question to ask, is it too much of a hassle to think about your cancer? You'd be in the very unfortunate position of not having a choice but to think about it, unless you were either hoping for a miraculous cure or you were resigned simply to doing nothing and dying. I think when it comes to the planet, most people watching this aren't expecting a miracle cure and aren't willing to throw in the towel and just wait to, for the planet to die. We have, unfortunately, a prognosis, which is that our planet is sick. And it's sick for reasons that we know because of certain activities that we participate in, choices that we make. Is it a hassle to make different choices? In the beginning, it probably will be a bit of a hassle. Um, we're going to have to stop doing certain things. Not stop, but do less of certain things that we really like. But we don't have to give them up completely. Uh, we just have to do them with moderation. And by doing those with moderation, we can heal our planet. Well, this isn't a crazy idea, but it's not correct. We make a false distinction between individual responsibility and governmental or corporate responsibility, as if they were completely separate things. Our government is not acting in the ways that we need it to, and there's absolutely no reason in the world to think that it's going to act in the ways that we need it to anytime soon. Corporations are not acting in the ways that we need them to. There's no reason in the world to think that they're going to anytime soon. What we need is for them to change laws, to regulate in such a way that it's easier for us to do the right thing, that it's easier for corporations to do the right thing, it's easier for individuals. But if they're not gonna do it, what do we do? Sit on our hands and complain about it or get upset about it or get angry at our leaders? Um, we can march and marching is a good thing. Whenever there's a climate march, I always participate, my kids participate, but I don't think it's enough. I think we have to act. We have to change our habits and we have to pull money away from the truly bad actors. Meat is a great example. We know that animal agriculture is, if not the number one cause of climate change, then the number two cause of climate change. According to the IPCC, which is like the gold standard for environmental science, we have no hope of saving the planet unless we eat less meat. In part, it does fall to us as individuals to take um, that choice into our own hands and to question every time we're in a restaurant or supermarket, you know, is it possible for me to eat a little bit differently than I have in the past? When we start to do that, restaurants are going to start to sell different kinds of foods. Corporations and the farm industry are going to start to produce different kinds of foods. A really great example of this is the veggie burger. Three months ago, six months ago in America, you couldn't find a veggie burger in a fast food restaurant anywhere in the country. Now, every major fast food restaurant, McDonald's, Burger King, Dunkin' Donuts, Subway, Taco Bell, you name it, all sell veggie burgers. It's not because the um, CEOs of those corporations woke up one morning and said, hey, you know what, we should be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. It's because people were demanding it, people were asking for it, and these corporations realized they had to supply it, and it was good business to supply it. Now that veggie burgers are available, it makes it that much easier for individuals to make environmentally conscious decisions. It makes it easier not to get a hamburger when you're a Burger King, but to get a veggie burger. It becomes what's called a virtuous cycle, where as we, in our lives, do different things, corporations will do different things, which make it easier for us in our lives to do different things, which make it easier for corporations to do different things. Well, that's clearly true, unless you're maybe the president of the United States. As individuals, we just don't have that much power, and it's easy and naive to overstate how much power the individual has, but it's also irresponsible to understate how much power the individual has. When it comes to something like our food choices, if you eat a burger or don't eat a burger, clearly the fate of the planet doesn't depend on that. But it's also true that over the course of your lifetime, the sum of the thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of meals that we eat will have a real world impact. But more than that, we don't eat alone. Nobody eats alone. If you make a change, your friends are gonna notice that you make a change. Your family members are gonna notice you make a change. And even strangers are gonna notice that you make a change. There's a phenomenon called social contagion, which has explained how habits spread across groups. If you are a smoker, it's likely that your friends, 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 friend, six degrees out, 
is also a smoker. While an individual can't save the planet by eating differently, flying differently, driving differently, what we have to remember is that when we make these decisions, we are also influencing the groups that we are members of. Even when we don't personally know some of the members of that group, habits start to collectively change and cultures start to collectively change. That seems to me the path forward and the reason to emphasize what each of us does in our own lives. Climate change protesters are a bit of a nuisance, but we need to have a bit of a nuisance. They are no nuisance relative to the kinds of loss that they are trying to protect. How do you compare the nuisance of a little bit of traffic to having to migrate you know, from a coastal city, or compare it to a shedding of years of life expectancy, or compare it to climate drought or climate-related illness. There are a lot of ways to work against climate change. One is to raise awareness, which is what protesters are doing, and to try to nudge governments to do what has to be done. But it's also extremely powerful to act in your life, not only to raise your voice, but to change your habits in such a way that you are compelling industry and compelling government to respond. Our voices are very powerful. I suspect our dollars are even more powerful, or our pounds in this case. So we should make sure that we're not giving our money to the companies that are creating the worst kinds of destruction, and that we're instead supporting environmentally conscientious companies. There's an old joke about two fish who bump into each other in the ocean one day, and one of the fish says, the water's kind of warm today. And the other one says, what the hell's water? Because a fish has spent its entire life in water, it's surrounded by water, it doesn't even realize that there's an alternative. Five years ago, the conversation about climate change was pretty much non-existent, and now, it's in the newspaper, if not on the front page of the newspaper, every single day. So the culture is changing very, very quickly, but when you're inside of the culture, it's not always obvious. But some of these changes are gonna happen slowly and sort of with a lot of grassroots ground swelling until they happen quickly. We will be adding straw after straw after straw after straw to the camel's back, and then eventually it will break. Well, first of all, I'd say we, don't, we shouldn't be talking about vegetarianism. We should be talking about eating less meat. And that might sound like a distinction without a difference, but most people can't easily imagine becoming vegetarian, but just about everybody can imagine eating somewhat less meat. And that's what the planet requires of us. The most recent science states that citizens of the UK and the United States need to eat about 90% less meat and about 60% less dairy. So that sounds like a lot, but it's still a world of difference from kind of absolute identity shift. What is the case is that there are people who live in what are called food deserts, which means they don't have access to fresh and healthy food. And that is a huge problem that we need to devote ourselves to solving. It should be an absolute right of anybody to have fresh and healthy food. But what does feel elitist to me is when somebody points at the existence of urban food deserts and says, because those people over there don't have access to fresh and healthy food, I, who do have access and have the means, and I'm not constrained in my eating choices, I'm not gonna make a change in my own life. It's the kind of quickest escape ramp for people who uh, are unwilling to uh, live differently. There is a poll in the Washington Post about three weeks ago that found that the majority of teenagers in America are feeling scared about climate change and are feeling angry about climate change, and that is so completely understandable. If I were a teenager right now, I would probably feel like the adult world had just given up, wasn't caring, wasn't trying, was unwilling to make any efforts to change, and was handing me a uh, burning baton and saying, good luck with that. What you should know is, first of all, that that's not altogether true, although it's shamefully close to the truth. There are a lot of people who are out there working very, very hard by your side to try to solve this problem but also that you have a huge amount of power and you should exercise your power. Exercise your power with your voices, go to marches, make sure that your teachers know, that your parents know, your city uh, officials know that this matters to you. But I would say even more, exercise your power with your habits and with how you spend your money. The Amazon is on fire right now and when people see images of the fires you know, racing across what we call the lungs of the earth, they're often distressed, upset, angry. We don't know what to do with that well of emotion. Are we supposed to be pissed off at 
Brazil's president? Are we supposed to be pissed off at Trump or Boris Johnson? Or We don't know. We have a lot of emotion, but not a lot of ways to use that emotion. 91% of Amazon Amazonian deforestation is for the meat industry, clearing land either for livestock or clearing land for crops that are fed to the livestock. If we could imagine a global boycott of beef, then we would protect the Amazon forever. It's exactly that simple. You don't have the power to enact a global boycott of beef but you've proven that you have the power to enact a pretty large boycott. Students around the world have been boycotting school to attend these marches, and I think that that is really admirable and something that I respect and am grateful for. But what if the boycott were not of school, but of an industry? After all, your teachers aren't the enemies here. It seems like teachers more often than not are, are marching with their students rather than telling their students not to march. What if we withdrew our support, if you withdrew your support, from this industry that is more responsible than any other industry for climate change. I think that that might both um, feel good and be a way to funnel your emotion into an action that matters and also in a very powerful and immediate way change the world. Thank you for watching. Please let us know what you thought in the comments and if you enjoyed this, subscribe to Platform.